Carmelo Anthony, 10-time All-Star, 6-time All-NBA, and a member of the NBA 75th anniversary team, which signified the 75 best NBA players of all time, at least according to a poll of a bunch of figures in the NBA, but that's another conversation for another day. But if there's one thing that makes up a great player and a champion at that is a mix of greatness, skill, and selflessness. And one of the main takes that I have that a lot of people do not agree with me with is the fact that I believe that every shortcoming that was brought upon to Carmelo Anthony was due to mainly himself and the main component that goes into his downfall as a player starts in his time in the Big Apple New York City in this video I want to do a deep dive on the downfall of Carmelo Anthony and how he ruined his career with the New York Knicks I know this video will most definitely piss off a large group of basketball fans out there but just know every claim I'm about to make will come with reason and elaboration but as usual this video will be a long one so be sure to like the video for more videos like these and subscribe to keep up with the channel for my next release but other than that you are in know who it is. Roll it! Three, two, one. But before we start, did you know that identity theft is committed every 14 seconds and is currently the fastest growing crime in America as we move on to the digital age? Well, if you don't want to be a victim of that, let me introduce you to today's video sponsor in Aura, the jersey sponsor of the Minnesota Timberwolves and your ticket to having a safe experience online with its built-in use of identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password manager, and antivirus software all combined into one easy to use app. With Aura, it'll monitor the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers and sends alerts fast right to your phone or email address. And it'll also give you near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries, like if someone was trying to open a loan or a credit card in your name. All of this, again, in one simple and convenient app that you can use today if you use my affiliate link in the description or comment section below, where if you do, you'll be able to try it out for 14 days for free and protect yourself from America's fastest growing crime. Thank you again to Or for sponsoring today's video, and let's get right into it. With the third pick in the 2003 NBA Draft, the Denver Nuggets select Carmelo Anthony from Syracuse University. The 2003 NBA Draft, as we all know, was highlighted by the super stacked top picks in high school LeBron James, top college prospect Dwayne Wade, and lastly the NCAA's most outstanding player of the tournament, Carmelo Anthony. With them being taken at the third pick to the Nuggets, they drafted themselves the ninth leading scorer in NBA history before they already knew it. And in time, in Denver, it came with a lot of pluses that showed off to the right people around him that he could really become a true champion in the league. From averaging 20 points a game in his rookie season, leading his team to a playoff spot in his rookie season, and improving their win total by 26 games the year before, it showed the Nuggets drafted someone who can lead this team for years to come. But as the years went by, you can see the cracks slowly form in the foundation. He may have been the same player to routinely lead the Nuggets to the playoffs every year, and there being their top scorer every single year, but there was problems starting in Denver that would only show how things would end up in the future, which is why I created this video. Firstly, let's talk about his relationship with his future coach and George Carl. George Carl came into to Carmelo's life in his second season after a 17 and 25 start to the season where his old coach couldn't cut it anymore and the organization wanted to take a step up in their contention dreams by hiring George Carl, a very capable coach in the NBA ranks. But one of those qualities of Carmelo started to show as coaches like George Carl work in a very is either my way or the highway mentality. And when he first came in, it absolutely worked into the season with him 32 and 8 and ended the season overall 49 and 33, which made things look like the perfect combination of coach and player. Player. kind of like how Larry Brown came into Allen Iverson's life and led him to an NBA Finals. And a lot of all-time greats had a great coach behind them with an impeccable system to bolster their team's performance. Again, Allen Iverson and Larry Brown, Michael Jordan and Phil Jackson, Tim Duncan and Greg Popovich, Pat Riley, and Magic Johnson. The list goes on. But now Carmelo was gifted a coach that would only help himself and the team's efforts more and more the more he buys into the system. However, as we all know, that wouldn't ever be the case. Even as the the Nuggets would continuously get better where at their best season obtaining a record of 54 and 28 in Carmelo's sixth season the relationship between himself and George Carl was always public and always a story for personalities and sports media all around to talk about even years later after the two split up but I can always admit that George Carl wasn't the best person in that endeavor the way he talked about Melo in the media post coaching career and especially in his book but again he was given a coach who could help him bring
sustain success to the team, but his lacking of buying in hindered things immensely. And then the second red flag that showed off how things could be in the future is, of course, his ego. And I know that all athletes have to have an ego, but you got to have one to play in the NBA, especially because having an ego means you have confidence. But we can all agree that sometimes you got to drop it a little bit to be really successful in sports. But Melo would only cause more problems than Denver. And I think George Carl said it best when it came to him needing to drop his attitude for the sake of winning games for the team and becoming a true all-time great. And it goes into their relation as a coach and player. Towards the game of basketball. How tough was it to coach him? Mello? Yeah. I don't think it was as tough as people think it is. You know, it, it, it was frustrating. And the frustration is, and I've said this many times, I said this when I was coaching him, that he could be, he could get 10 assists a game. He could get 15 rebounds yes, a game. You're right. I think he could be a damn good defender. And and he's a great scorer. So he had all the whole pack. So you think this is a choice? Uh, you can blame him on, you know, as a coach, we never got those buttons pushed to where he would commit to being a triple-double star. And with that, unlike all other all-time greats, he was never able to take that next step to further help his team really be serious contenders year by year. And that's proven by the fact that he only made it out of the first round twice in his entire career. And it was also routinely characterized by the fact of when his shot never falled, he couldn't provide anything else to the team. So why did his old coach and George Carl think that to be the case? But right. why wouldn't he see what LeBron is doing or Kobe's doing or some of these other players and say, I, I need to be more like that to be recognized as one of the great players. He's always going to be one of the great scorers in the game. Never one of the great players, one of the great scorers. Well, I think the thing that, uh, you know, the thing I think, my answer when you asked me that question was, my mind said, scoring is easy for him. And you, you, I think scoring in the NBA is the hardest thing to do. It's, it's really hard to score points against defenses that are tilted and defined to take you out. And I've seen him just score 40 on a pretty good defensive team. And that skill is probably his comfort zone. And that's where he probably gravitates to, as we all gravitate to our comfort zones. Once again, some of the all-time greats are willing to become more versatile and make themselves more of a threat on the court and to help the team in the long run. And like Dan Patrick said, as LeBron James became more multifaceted, Melo stayed the same. And at the end of the day, we see where that took both of their careers in the long run. But as the Nuggets were looking forward to the future and wanted to offload contracts, Carmelo wanted out and he was traded to the New York Knicks on February 22nd, 2011 to start his new journey in the big Apple uh, reporting that the deal is finally done. The Carmelo Anthony trade saga is finally over. Anthony going to his desired destination, Madison Square Garden, play with the Knicks. This a very detail oriented trade. So we're going to show you all the components so you can get an idea of why this took so long. The Knicks get Anthony point guard Chauncey Billups, Sheldon Williams, Anthony Carter and former Nick. Now going back to the Knicks, Ronaldo Balkman, the Denver Nuggets will get Danilo Gallinari, Raymond Felton, Wilson Chandler, three starters. Timofey Mozgov also has been starting lately for the Knicks. So four Knicks starters, a first-round pick coming from the Warriors, two second-round picks, and $3 million in cash. RJ Donde has tweeted, this is a great deal for the Denver Nuggets. On February 22nd, 2011, Carmelo Anthony was traded to the New York Knicks with some of his teammates alongside him, while the Knicks gave up Danilo Gallinari, Raymond Felton, Wilson Chandler, and Timofey Mozgov. The Knicks for Carmelo Anthony traded away was basically their whole starting lineup for that one player, which as you can imagine was a huge risk on the side of the Knicks, but in the market of the bloodthirsty Knicks fans, either you have success or it's a failure. And considering the Knicks up until that point were on a six year drought from the playoffs, they needed to make a splash for a big time player, especially one who can gravitate more stars to play with them potentially. And while LeBron James did his thing combining himself, D Wade and Chris Bosh, Carmelo was brought to New York to basically do the same. And it was a mutual thought as Carmelo wanted to go to New York. And as we all know, especially in retrospect, it was with a big lights and opportunity, unlike what a star would have in a small market team like Denver. But with a move of that magnitude being done and the dust settling, Carmelo Anthony found himself on the Knicks with a fresh opportunity, a new and revolutionary coach, Mike D'Antoni, 
and possibly his best teammate in his career, Omari Stoudemire, who was traded for a bag of chips and Blueberry Fago from the Suns. And everything seemed like it was going to be a beneficial move. The Nuggets were able to stay above water with their newly formed team, ending the season as a 50-win team. And the Knicks ended their season with their best record in years with a 42-40 and 40 record. And for Carmelo, in that time, his individual success was amazing, putting on 26 points a game on amazing efficiency. And for the first time in his career, he shot over 40% from three. But for the Knicks, they were all things inconsistent as the Knicks are usually. In that first season, Melo had him a record of 14 and 13. But for now, let's just leave things to a player just trying to gel and gain chemistry with his team, especially where you have the Knicks having a six game losing streak late in the season and then immediately getting a seven game winning streak right after, which gave them the sixth seed by two games. But let's move on about someone we mentioned earlier with the Knicks that really gave a big influence to the Knicks and their success. And that is, of course, Mike D'Antoni. As we all know, Mike D'Antoni is one of the most influential coaches in the game of basketball to date in this current era with his strategies of playing basketball in the most efficient way possible with threes and shots at the basket. But back in 2011, he was known as a coach that was revolutionary for seven seconds or less offense with the Phoenix Suns. But after leaving the Suns, he was looking to create something similar in New York and with very minimal progress there, he was then able to obtain Carmelo Anthony midway through his second season in New York. With Carmelo Anthony, he could have put his name back in the stratosphere of best coaches in the league. But after their loss to a sweep to the Celtics, we can all argue that the duo of Mike D'Antoni and Carmelo Anthony was going to go nowhere, which will be the first strike for Carmelo. The way he ran Mike D'Antoni out of New York and forcing him to resign. It takes a lot to make a coach straight up to say that he's out of here. And this is one of the most viral situations of it. Starting off in the 2011-2012 season, the Knicks came back in during the lockout season with Tyson Chandler, who won DPOY, furthering their post strength and giving them one of the best front courts in the NBA. But there was tension only rising to the point to where Mike D'Antoni leaving on March the 14th, 2012. And the way Mike D'Antoni talks about Carmelo only showed that he was not meant to succeed when it came to competing for championships. And again, the sources of this were absolutely plentiful. Via Fox Sports News, Mike D'Antoni was quoted to say, I just went in and quit, said Mike D'Antoni in an interview, citing a team meeting where Carmelo Anthony gave the franchise an ultimatum. Either D'Antoni leaves or he was gone. And I can imagine Imagine where Mike D'Antoni was coming from there as Carmelo was using his incoming free agency status against the organization to make them either choose between himself or the coach. And it sucks that teams give that much power to their players, especially when you consider how things are nowadays in the NBA with that exact same problem. But Carmelo Anthony was one of the first backfires and negatives of the player empowerment movement, making his coach leave the team so he can control how everything goes down there in New York. Mike D'Antoni, who was one of the most influential coaches at the time, if given time, could make something happen just like he did in Phoenix with Steve Nash and Amare with a countless amount of great role players. But with Carmelo, he was never able to meet my eye with him and it caused him to resign. Years later, there was even an article that came up about how Amare Stoudemire and Carmelo didn't even see eye to eye themselves. And guess what it was due to? You can imagine it was due to their system that Carmelo chose not to follow. After the resignation, Basketball Network writes, that relationship eroded so badly that Mike D'Antoni officially resigned. Whether people wanted to say that he was pushed, shoved, or aspect added, Amare and Carmelo never really saw eye to eye. Amare wanted to do the things the D'Antoni way, while Carmelo wanted to do the things that benefited his game the most. And with more evidence towards his claim, listen to this quote by SNY.TV that explains further how Carmelo was never fully into Mike D'Antoni's system, saying, Stoudemire added that Anthony did not want to play power forward despite head coach Mike D'Antoni wanting to utilize the four a lot in his offense. So Stoudemire played power forward a lot instead of center, while Anthony stayed at the three. And also, before everyone was on the same page, we had a solid idea of a system of what we were going to deal with and then once that changed, it became very frustrating because a lot of the guys were not on the same page. The management wasn't on the same page, so that was one of the reasons why I decided to go elsewhere. So from day one, Carmelo refused to cooperate for Mike D'Antoni's wishes to operate in the same seven seconds or less small ball lineup that made the mid 2000s Suns so successful. It was either his way or the highway, and due to that, everything fell apart, and by everything, I mean everything. And you can argue that due to that, Carmelo asking out of Denver so soon ruined his chances at having a much better team with the Knicks as he was due for a contract that same year he was traded to the Knicks, but instead he bit the bullet too soon and made the Knicks trade away basically their whole starting lineup. On that same article I mentioned earlier, Stoudemire talked about that same point saying, I built a great relationship and friendship with Wilson Chandler, Gallinari, Raymond Felton, Timothy Mozgov, all of those guys became like my protege, Stoudemire said on the podcast. I love being instrumental with their development, so it was tough to see them go. But as we all know, there was one thing that truly brought their true potential to the New York Knicks as a team with Carmelo Anthony. And this is where strike number two comes in. And that was the 
Linsanity Saga. Now, I know there's a billion videos made on YouTube about the Linsanity story, so I will just make a quick recap so that I can fully talk about the aftermath and the fallout due to it. Of course, as we all know, Jeremy Lin at that point was a point guard looking for an NBA home, playing both in the G League and for a very short time for the Golden State Warriors. But the next year after getting waived, he found himself on the Knicks literally two days after the 2011-2012 season started and was kept as a reserve due to the amount of guards on the team like aging Mike Bibby and Baron Davis. But once injuries started to strike the Knicks from all over, including to Carmelo Anthony in his second start ever, it became the Jeremy Lin Show. And again, that's right, Lin Sanity at the ACC. Talk about a young man with the ice in the veins. And during that amazing streak of games where he gained the respect of New Yorkers and the NBA alike, he averaged 18 points and 7 assists a game. But specifically when Carmelo was out of the lineup, he was the main guy in New York as he averaged 24 points and 9 assists a game. But as you can imagine, things definitely slowed down once Melo was back in the lineup and went back to being the Melo show. But while Jeremy Lin was being hailed as the next point guard in New York, people were speculating about how would Carmelo be able to take that. And it was anything but good. Because as Jeremy Lin was the talk of the state, people speculated that Carmelo Anthony hated that as one of the main reasons he went to New York in the first place is because it was the mecca of basketball because he'd be the guy in one of the biggest markets of sports historically and other reasons but when someone comes through especially as unexpected as Lynn some animosity could be created here's the deal I have said Jeremy Lynn is a good ball player I've said that he's clearly the future point guard for the New York Knicks but that this is Melo's team that when it comes time, the fourth quarter, I expect, I don't hope, I don't wish, I expect the ball to be in your hands. I expect you to be moving the ball, sharing the ball. People talk about this selfish, all this nonsense, ridiculous nonsense that it permeated the airwaves over the last few weeks. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is the man on the New York Knicks when the fourth quarter arrives and it's time to close. Everybody needs to fall back with all of this insanity <laughs> nonsense. Give Melo the ball and close the deal. I don't do fluff either, which is why recently <laughs> this man and I got into a discussion that turned into a debate about whether Carmelo is a superstar, a top five player. What I'll say to you to your face is this. LeBron James, D. Wade, and all of these guys, when we look at them as superstars, I cannot give you, I can give you the star because you, you're big time talent. I cannot give you the superstar label because in all the years, the same amount of time that LeBron James has been in this league, you have been out of the first round one time. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to sit there and we're going to look at LeBron James and we're going to say that LeBron James doesn't have any rings, at some point in time, we have to look at you and we have to sit there and say, you got to give us more appearances out of the first round. Was I wrong about that? You wasn't wrong. I, and I, when, I, when I talked to you, the one-on-one -on -one interview, I told you, that was something that I accepted. Right. I accept that, you know, and, and that's my goal. I, I go out there every night and every year. Uh, making the playoffs is, that, that's not my goal anymore. I, I never miss a playoff since I've been in the league. And now it's time to take it to the next step. So what you're saying is, is, is absolutely. And with interviews about his relationship with Lynn being commonplace all over the media, and with the media saying that Melo needs Lynn to take that next step as other teams in the East improve their armory of talent, what ends up happening? Well, Jeremy Lin takes a deal to play in Houston. Now, we can all agree that New York had to be Jeremy Lin's first choice. This was the same team that made him the reason he was known in the NBA in the first place. The place that cheered for him the loudest in his basketball career. Even if the Lin Sanity run was just a flash in the pan, he would forever stay a crowd and fan favorite for years to come. So what happened? Well, many speculations were made on how Carmelo became a huge component on Jeremy Lin leaving. Firstly, from this article made by Tim Keown, a source says that Lin was getting what Carmelo was promised, says a source close to the team, and Carmelo thought D'Antoni was going to favor Jeremy Lin more in the offense, so he had to get D'Antoni out of there. Which brings into light the main criticism of Carmelo as an athlete, his pride and his ego. If he ain't the top dog on the team, then he can't have it either way, which could have made Carmelo have animosity and jealousy towards Lynn. And honestly, this can be argued even more when you found out that years later, that Lynn barely even talked to Melo in the first place or even had a relationship with him during his time in New York. How did your popularity affect your teammates, in particular Carmelo? I saw where he wasn't part of the documentary. What kind of impact do you think that had on him since it was his team? Um, I, you know, and I think this is something that will always be speculation. Um, I never knew. Then I don't know now, 
I've never had a conversation about it personally with him. Um, but the only thing I, and I've said this and it's, I don't say it just to like be fake is I've never had a conflict with him personally. Um, everything that happened, everything that you know is what I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everything I heard from, you know, when, when, D'Antoni came out multiple years later when Amari came out multiple years later. Like in the moment, I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't know what was happening. I thought the Knicks, the Knicks were going to match me. Um, they told me they were going to match me. I just assumed it. Like I didn't understand what was happening. And, uh, and I still don't know to this day exactly what happened. But I do know that was a magical moment. That was an amazing season. And he's part of the story and he was part of our team. And, and, uh, and we don't make the playoffs without him. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, from my end, it's looking back, you know, I, I don't dwell on that, that, that aspect of it. So with that main piece of context added, it made so much more sense when people brought up that point. But like Lynn said, the Knicks promised to bring him back with a little influence from Carmelo Anthony from the outside, all of that could have changed, especially when he already threatened to lead the team once and was probably really damn serious about it. It could just be the same ultimatum, but after that whole debacle, Jeremy Lin then signed a deal with the Houston Rockets and left the place that gave him his chance in the NBA. Marcellus, I'll start with you first. Bring it. Your thoughts about the New York Knicks and whether or not they should match this offer for Jeremy Lin. I think they should. I mean, I think they're making a huge mistake right here. Yes. I mean, first of all, you got to talk about the only thing that intrigues a franchise, intrigues a fan base more than production, is potential. And you talk about a 23-year-old point guard who went out there last year and limited time really changed the landscape and expectations of this franchise going forward. Now let him finish the deal. Mm -hmm. There's a problem when you talk about a 39-year-old Jason Kidd who made a kitty decision this weekend. We'll leave that to the side. Or Raymond Felton, the guy who was mm -hmm. expendable last mm -hmm. year, and now you're going to come back to that rerun. Is that going to change your expectations going forward? Or is that going to change the outcome against the Miami Heat team in the Eastern Conference? I don't think so. Even if it's $30 million against your cap in year three? Well, first of all, when you go from college to the pro game, the first thing they tell you in the locker room is, it's a business. And we know it's a business on the court and off the court. He handles his business in limited time on the court. Off the court, no doubt, no question, this guy is going to be somebody you want to make sure is on your payroll. They're making a bad Preach decision it, on Preach. and off the court. Uh, I don't feel but, just, but, but don't he just dropped some knowledge on right. But you know what? Even through all of that, getting a coach who helped revolutionize the game for the NBA and helped multiple players become some of the best players in the NBA and created MVPs within that same time frame and also being one of the main components of running out a player who would only help your team, Carmelo Anthony did have his best season that next year. In the 2012-13 season, and people constantly call it Carmelo's peak NBA season, tying a then career high of 50 points against the peak Miami Heatles and winning at their home court, leading the NBA in scoring per game with 28 points a game, being third in MVP voting, and leading the Knicks to their first 50 win season since the 1999-2000 season. He also did that all while Amari Stoudemire was out for the season. Again, this is truly the nail in the coffin when it came to reassuring Melo that he could do all of this by himself, and again, it truly just made it justified. And the media said, the same remarks. He truly made his case when he went out there and defended himself with his play, leading the Knicks by himself to a clear second seed only behind the super team Miami Heat. And once again, he made his case known where he was vowed to get rid of Mike D'Antoni and Jeremy Lin, leading the Knicks out of the first round against the Asian Boston Celtics team, with Carmelo Anthony leading the way in scoring for both teams in all six games. But once he went against the Indiana Pacers, the story became a whole lot different. Because as the Celtics were doing a good job guarding Melo, making him have shooting splits of 38% from the field and 29% from three, the offensive game of the Celtics was very lackluster as you had Jeff Green leading the way of Boston rather than the core of Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, KG, and Rajon Rondo. But in the second round, Carmelo caught fire about every game averaging 28 points a game on good playoff shooting splits. But anyone who remembered how that series went, the Pacers who led the NBA in defensive rating, main strategy about neutralizing Carmelo's teammates 
which in turn hindered Carmelo, is making him have to do everything and also using his lack of playmaking skills against them. So while Melo was looking like a hero, trying to lead his team to victory every night, Frank Vogel made sure that that same thing he loves to do against him by making him have to win games by his own hands. And while some players throughout NBA history can be up for the task, Carmelo was not. Due to that, teammates around him like J.R. Smith averaged 13 points a game while shooting 28% from the field and 23% from three. And even Shepard dropped nine points a game while shooting 37% from the field and 34% from three. And all the team around him crumbled to the best defensive team in the league, while Carmelo Anthony did not. Which ends this great individual season for Carmelo and would be the last time Carmelo Anthony would see the playoffs as his 03 draft class buddies in Miami win their second championship together. Now we can truly discuss how his past actions is now bearing consequences as his downfall as a player and reputation wise starts here. Because as Knicks fans were expecting a repeat season of similar success the next year, the New York Knicks had nothing to do to build upon their amazing season from the year before. As the most they did was trade for Andrea Bargnani for the Toronto Raptors. And it was safe to say while other teams around the league were building up their squads one way or another, the Knicks absolutely regressed. Amari Stoudemire was a shell of his former self averaging 11 points a game and still making $20 million a year. No one on the team was taking a leap out to help Carmelo and things in the organization all around was crumbling, which didn't help any recruitment that Melo may or may not wanted to do. But that mainly starts off with Phil Jackson's tenure as president of basketball operations. And obviously the many moves like hiring Derek Fisher, trying to implement the triangle offense to New York with Melo and other things that really highlighted just how weird his tenure was with the team. But again, this video is not made for that. But even within all the craziness within the front office, Bill Jackson knew he was basically in an impossible situation trying to get Carmelo to be more team oriented. And we know what happened when Phil Jackson was able to do that with a certain Michael Jordan. But in a podcast with Stefan Bondi, he further went into why that was the case, saying that Carmelo, I think, wanted to be a leader, but I don't think he was completely new how to be a leader as a player. And I think that strength of his personality was intimidating some of the coaches that were asked to coach the team. And so there wasn't this compliance that was happening to happen between players and coaches and as much as i try to interject with my own beliefs i don't think you're close enough to the ground in that situation to really be effective in dictating how things are to be done but that goes further into how he'll command the situation just not know how to lead the same people into that situation which led to his many blunders and shortcomings in the playoffs compared to other stars who will command on the court locker room practice etc but within new york he was still putting up buckets for the next four years with no progress being made from the ages of 29 to 32 as he led his team to a record during that time of 117 to 211 but at least he got his four all-star appearances and closing in more and more in that all-time scoring list but i think what's crazier towards his entire new york tenure was the fact that he resigned with the team in the 2014 offseason the same year they went 37 and 45 did he see an opportunity to win there after missing the playoffs for the first time in his career or did he just want to stay the guy in new york the world may never know. But what's ironic about that entire situation is the fact that he was the same person to complain about staying through a rebuild in Denver and then decided to stay through one in New York as soon as he signed that contract as they racked up lottery picks year by year. But finally, on September 25th, 2017, after all the years of waiting for an opportunity to come to actually contend with the team, he found his opportunity with the OKC Thunder via trade to join the duo of MVP winner Russell Westbrook and perennial all-star Paul George. But here comes strike number three that further shows how his time in New York ruined his entire career and that is him never learning his lesson. Throughout his entire time in New York, he was told over and over again to drop his ego and become more team oriented for the success of the team. He was coming into the season as a 33 year old regressing asset whose only skill was scoring. But from day one, not even day one, before day one, he was already starting problems by not accepting any role other than star of the team. When there was two other stars that were clearly better than him. And we all know this with this viral interview clip that should have set the scene as the catastrophe to come. Um, how do you feel about you know starting at the four or the concept of starting at the four or even coming <clears throat> off the bench? And the second question is... Well, me? Oh. <laughs> 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 I, guess, I guess that answers that part. I, I mean, I don't know where that started, where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pete, they said I got to come off the bench. <laughs>
And guess what? Due to the odd coaching of Billy Donovan, he allowed the 33-year-old Melo to start, and he was okay in that role to his credit, but he was the usual black hole on offense in his time there, still doing the same meatball tactics at times when there were clearly other options on the team better than him that could do things with him that could give him more open shots as a shooter and have him be more of a scoring punch off the bench instead of him just doing the same thing that he was doing in New York. And considering the Thunder were literally dead last in the NBA in bench scoring that year with 25 points a game, the asking of him to come off the bench was really a suggestion that would be for the betterment of the team and not an insult to his skills. But when you have the attitude of him, it was again either his way or the highway. And due to that, he was shipped off to the Hawks in a three-team train to finally let go of the dead weight that he was being in OKC. And with that, he was officially considered a nuisance to most teams as he won't accept a role appropriate for his skill set. He was no longer the mid-20s Carmelo that would command whatever he wanted and have the skill sets to back it up. He was in his mid 30s out of prime mellow that we could still provide for a team but not in the way that he thinks and due to that it only hindered his credibility in the league but once again he received another chance in the league with the houston rockets where he would again meet up with his old coach mike d'antoni who's on the verge the verge of turning james harden into one of the best offensive threats in nba history and once again all over the media people speculated would he finally be willing to come off the bench what's your biggest takeaway max oh did a no look pass. That was <laughs> My biggest takeaway is Carmelo is apologizing for shooting a long two. My biggest takeaway is Carmelo might work out. And Stephen A., you've been talking about this because playing with Chris Paul and also asking to go there, wanting to go there. It's important whether fans or who are used to the old school way of doing things in sports realize it or not. It's important nowadays with athletes, not as much in the NFL, but certainly in the NBA, as empowered as they've become, for the player to, to want to be in a situation. Carmelo wanted to go to Houston, Stephen A. He understands that the league has changed and the understanding of what's important has, in, has, has changed. So you get a guy like uh, Rudy Gay, for example. When Rudy Gay turned pro, we're like, ooh, that might be a star. You and the problem was he was playing in a league that was becoming increasingly efficient, an inefficient game, lots of long twos and stuff. Now, there's still talent in there, right? A guy like Popovich goes, no, I can, I can work with that. And in the right situation, that can be unlocked. But it's, it's the right sign that Carmelo shoots along to and realizes that's not what we do here. And is, it, it's a signal that he's willing to play the way they want him to play, that he is bought in. And it could work out in Houston better than I thought. Away from that interview thinking that if Coach D'Antoni says to him, not on some nights, <laughs> but on every, every night, night, you're in the second unit, is that going to work out? You can hear he's kind of unease at the whole coming off the bench conversation. I mean, he, he hasn't quite embraced that. Um, but getting from this, this interview, if I, I think if Mike D'Antoni is frank with him, have these conversations of what he needs to do, because Melo understands this is it's now and never for me to win a championship. This, this is first chance of, you know, contending for a title. Right. And he has to understand I have to sacrifice in order for this team to excel to what we're trying to achieve. I think if Coach D'Antoni is frank with him on what he needs, he, he's going to do whatever it, it, he has to do to, to make it work. However, the Carmelo Anthony and Houston saga only lasted 10 games where he was then benched for months until he was traded to the Bulls and then waived. As Daryl Morey of the Houston Rockets says, the organization and Melo decided to part ways. But at this point, I think this is a more sad part of Carmelo Anthony's career as he was having pity parties all over sports media making the case on why he should be a primary player in the NBA. Kind of like how Isaiah Thomas does on Twitter to a lesser extent. And the interviews were plentiful as he was without a spot in the NBA for almost a full year until he got a spot on the Portland Trailblazers. But at least you could say that he was able to do his thing with the Trailblazers, playing with them for one year as a starter and the next year off the bench. And then finally, when his time came to an end with the Banana Boat crew, well, except it was just LeBron on the Lakers, where he was able to basically do whatever he wanted. But we all know how that went as a team kind of terribly. And now we're in current day. Despite his efforts of trying to get back into the NBA, Carmelo Anthony is out of a job once again. And honestly, it has nothing to do with him. It's just truly because he is getting old and teams can get younger players who do the same exact thing, if not better, and possibly for the same price. But once again, Carmelo's time in New York really screwed up his second half of his career. And just like George Cole said, he was never willing to do the necessary things to help his team out. Star players who want to win championships do a bit of everything. Playmaking, defense, hustling, 
anything to get a championship. But the only thing Carmelo Anthony will be known for in his entire NBA career was his scoring prowess, and that's about it. Him never giving up his ego and doing things that'll only help out his team just made it harder for anyone to accept him without expecting the same exact thing to happen to them. He had a coach who would only help out his production, Mike D'Antoni, who had done the same thing to multiple players, one who is considered to be one of the best shooting guards of all time, got rid of a solid point guard who would only help out his team when they was trying to take a next step to beat other powerhouses in the East, and when his time came to get out of New York, continued to overvalue himself in the NBA, which instead of getting a heartfelt good by seen by other stars over the years gave NBA fans a sour taste in the mouth whenever he was mentioned but I made a one-shot video on this topic last year which a lot of people who agreed with it and a lot of people who disagree with it but I finally wanted to put the nail in the coffin on this conversation give my absolute take on this and leave the rest of you to comment on it however you like but as always I hope you enjoyed today's video and learned something new as my vision for this channel is to inform and entertain check out my social medias for the inside life of Alvin you know the channel news check out my twitch where I stream weekly and and lastly, if you want to talk to your boy, there is always my Discord. But with all that out of the way, this is your boy, Alvini Linguini, saying peace.